second lesson today is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. Listen now for the word of the Lord. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told her, or they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with, with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of the Lord. Thomas Merton uh, was a spiritual writer from many years ago, and he used to always say that a person is known better by his questions than by his answers. And I say that because when you look at the opening chapter of John's gospel, you see that John the Baptist already has disciples, and two of them leave John the Baptist to follow Jesus. And as soon as that happens, Jesus turns around and looks at him and says, what are you looking for? You know the scene. He doesn't go into questions about all of their wrongdoings or their sins. His tone is not hostile. It's not accusatory. No, he, he asks them what they, what they really want. Um, he, he calls out their deepest desires, the very best within them. And then they say, well, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. And in that moment, Jesus invites them into a relationship with him. And that's the Christian walk. It's all about waiting for that invitation. It's all about that connection. It's all about hearing the invitation to come into a relationship with God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to imagine this morning Jesus is looking into your eyes. He's looking at you or he's placed his hand on your shoulder and you hear the words, what are you looking for? What do you want? What is it that you truly desire? Would you even know where to begin looking? There's a woman, she comes home uh, late into the evening, and she notices her neighbor is on her side of the driveway, frenetically looking for something. And so she says, hey, what, what's going on? Neighbor says, I lost my keys. So she says, oh, I'll help you look. Did, did you lose them in this area? Uh, she said, no, 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 I, I lost them on, 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 the, on my side of the driveway. And she said, well, wh why are you looking for them over here? And he said, because you, you have better lights. People are, are searching. They're looking. But sometimes they don't really know what they're looking for, or even where to look. What are you looking for today? What will satisfy your deepest desire? You know, as we inch our way closer and closer to living in a pandemic for an entire year, a full year, I wonder if some of you would say to Jesus, I want to be free. I want to be free from my fear and from my self-doubt. I want a deeper faith. 
I want peace from all this unrest. I'm tired. I want friendships. I want connectivity. I would love to experience the joy of companionship. I don't know what you would say. Maybe some of us would say we, we would really like to experience more of you, Lord, more of your love, more of your power, more of your grace. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, knew in the early 1500s the importance of holy desires. You know what he used to teach his students? He'd say, look, when you pray, you ask God to give you exactly what it is you're looking for. Be specific. Be specific. Don't sugarcoat anything. When you pray, ask the Lord to give you what it is you want. The Buddhist monks of Tibet also recognize the spiritual wisdom of knowing what it is we seek. Thousands of years, their dharma has been based on the understanding that the spiritual life begins by naming what we truly want. What are you looking for? You know, our deepest desires have tremendous power. If we can name them and channel them toward God, our lives can be transformed. We can be different. We we can be changed from the inside out. Maybe even become friends of God. In today's gospel lesson, there are three separate stories. Did you catch that? There's the story of Simon Peter's mother-in-law. There's a story of the whole town gathered outside of the door of the house. And then there's the story of Jesus going off to be alone and to pray. And check this out. All three stories are connected by the same idea of searching. Searching for purpose, searching for rhythm, Searching for wholeness. Now, not only are our stories connected by searching, they're connected by other people helping other people search. This is beautiful. And I think it's one of the reasons why Paul confidently says in his letter to the Corinthians, hey, I've become all things to all people, so that I might by all means save some. In other words, relationships matter. Don't be a know-it-all. If you can build a relationship, do it. If there's an opportunity to model the love of Jesus Christ to your neighbor, do it. And if they're searching, help them in their search. First, there's the story of the healing of Simon Peter's mother-in-law. There she is violently ill. She's got that fever. She has all these guests coming into her house. She can't do anything about it. And what happens? Without any fanfare, Jesus simply takes her hand and she is made well. She gets up. She begins serving. Right there. No questions asked. The healing touch of Jesus, this power of his love, the intimacy of his love, She gets up and she begins to serve. And the the Greek word that Mark uses is diakone, the same root word we get for our English word deacon, servant, to serve. There are some scholars that would argue Simon Peter's mother-in-law was the first deacon in the early church. And I'm not going to argue that. I think that's really cool. So in her prayerful searching, She longed to be made well so she could resume her role in ministering, waiting upon, taking care of others. And this is not insignificant, and this should not be viewed as menial work. Later in Mark's gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, if any of you wants to be first, then you need to be the very last and a servant, deacon of all. So for you deacons here this morning, I want you to think about the implications of this passage for your life as you serve here at Central Reformed. So there's the healing of the mother-in-law. And then there's this whole crowd that gathers outside the door. Think about this. Everybody. The whole town. 
What we're to assume, I think, is that everybody's searching for Jesus. The word got out. This guy is the real deal. He loves, he heals, he can make a difference for you. And so they all come. They're all standing outside of the house. And they're all searching for wholeness. They want to see Jesus. They want to be made well. These are people with evil spirits and with sicknesses and pain. Now think about all those people in the crowd. Imagine looking into their faces, searching, expressing that look of eager anticipation. And now imagine you're in the crowd. And you're standing there next to them. What are you looking for? Now, we might not be suffering from something that's clearly uh, uh, defined right now. But we're all suffering from something. And we like to be healed from it. Depression. Crippling self-doubt. Broken relationships. Addictions menacing old feelings hidden just below the surface of our consciousness. These are, there are as many forms of brokenness as there are people searching for Jesus. So there's the healing of the mother-in-law, there's the crowd standing outside of the door, and then there's the story about Jesus being alone, and going off to pray. And the disciples go hunting for him. So he's somewhere deep into the Judean wilderness. Wherever he went, they had to go looking, and it wasn't easy. And so by this time, their searching is not for wholeness, but to fulfill their own agenda for popularity. Notice Mark shows Jesus as needing time away from the crowd. Time to be in close contact with God. Time, time to do some self-care. To refresh, to renew. To not be distracted. To be his best self. Why should any of us think that we can get by without engaging in self-care? You know, when I was the pastor of uh, the little Dutch Reformed Church in Manhasset, um, the Quaker Meeting House was just around the corner on Northern Boulevard. Beautiful. One of the oldest buildings in Manhasset. It, it's, it's not a large church or a gathering place by any stretch of the means, but um, there is a group that faithfully meet there. And they've been meeting there since 1700. And I, I knew a few of the folks who were a part of that congregation and a colleague of mine actually decided to attend one of their meetings. And if you don't know anything about the Quakers, what the Quakers usually do is they will just sit in silence for long periods of time. So there's my colleague, and 15 minutes goes by. No one says a word. He leans into his Quaker friend and says, Hey, man, when's the service going to get started? And the Quaker friend leans back into him and says, When this meeting is over. The point is, we have to take time to be with God. We need to make room for silence so we can hear the voice of God, so we can experience wholeness and be our best selves. One of the things that I, I always like to knock about the Reformed Church is we talk a lot. Larry will testify to this. We, in, our, in our services, we, we tend to talk a lot. And that silence makes us really uncomfortable. And I don't know why that is, but it does. Maybe because we're not sure what's going to happen if we're really listening. So while the disciples want to keep the momentum of popularity going, Jesus refused to be boxed in, to be easy to find. And he tells them, look, my purpose is more than just wonder-working power here. We need to go to the neighboring towns. We need to bring good news to them. We need to bring encouragement, discipleship, preaching, teaching. And we need to empower others to be their best selves. 
So that's it. Simon's mother-in-law, the crowd gathered outside the door, and Jesus going off to be alone to pray. Three stories. They're all connected to searching. They're all connected to people, real people, who were looking for purpose, rhythm, and wholeness. And I don't know where you're at today. I don't know if you can put your finger on what it is exactly you are looking for. If you had binoculars, would you find it? I knocked the Reformed Church for talking a lot, but one of the best things about our faith is that it's not so much that in our searching we find, but that in our searching God finds us. And in those difficult moments, we realize, oh, that's right, there he is. There's Jesus. He's out in that lonely place. He's out in the crowd. He's, he's, he's in the house, or he's in that place where we least expect him to be, and we see him, and he sees us, and he says, I know you. And in his knowing us, he grants us wholeness. He grants us rhythm and purpose for our living. What are you looking for? Keep searching. Let's pray. Mighty God, thank you for this moment that we have together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Grant that the words we have heard this day may through your grace be so grafted within our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruits of your spirit to the honor and praise of your glorious name through Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's people say, Amen.